academic dean here at Hartford Seminary. And I have the distinguished pleasure of introducing my colleague, Dr. Hossein Kamali. But before I do that, I just want to uh, extend a warm welcome to visitors. For those of you who don't know much about Hartford Seminary, we've been here uh, in the greater Hartford area since 1834. Not me, myself, personally, but a lot of us. And um, we've, we're quite distinguished. We're first in a number of things uh, historically. We have six different programs um, here. Everything from certificate programs, the Black Ministries Program, the Women's Leadership Institute, the International Peacemaking Program, all the way up to a PhD program, PhD in Islamic Studies and Christian Muslim Relations, as well as our two largest programs, the Doctor of Ministry, which is a second professional degree for imams, rabbis, priests, and pastors, as well as our largest degree, which is a Master of Arts and Religious Studies. So there's information on the table over here about our programs, but if you don't feel like you can, you're ready to dive into a program, all of our courses, or most of our courses, are available for audit. So you can feel free to audit a course um, one of our many courses, and I think tonight you'll get an excellent uh, introduction to our faculty here at Hartford Seminary and the great faculty that we have. So I'm delighted to be able to introduce my colleague, Dr. Hossein Kamali, Associate Professor of Islamic Studies and holder of the Imam Ali Chair for Shi Studies and Dialogue among the Islamic Legal Schools. Dr. Kamali has a distinguished CV and resume. He has uh, uh, his master's degree, his first master's degree from New York University, second from Columbia University, and his PhD from Columbia University. That makes him an official New Yorker, I think. Three degrees from New York. Um, he has also studied, listen to this, Mathematics, Statistics, and Operations Research, Computer and Electrical Engineering. He's actively participated in formal classes in teaching philosophy, epistemology, Persian logic, probability theory, traditional Islamic studies. This is what we call a traditional medieval polymath. <laughs> Not that you're from the medieval period, but you reflect that great sense of learning that we all come to expect from the Islamic tradition. Um, he's taught it at the City University of New York, Columbia University, and Barnard College. His first English text or English book published, God and Man in Tehran, Contending Visions of the Divine from the Qajars to the Islamic Republic it was published in 2018. And this current book that he's going to be speaking about has just come out from One World Press, which is a great public, a great press to be published, uh, A History of Islam and 21 Women. So I know we're all delighted and excited to hear Dr. Hossein Kamali. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you, Dean Grafton, for your most kind and gracious, um, if only undeserved, introduction for me. Uh, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, for venturing out in this cold Connecticut night and coming here and joining me for uh, the first, for my first book talk for this new book. Um, I hope you will enjoy it. I hope you will join me in a um, critical discussion uh, at the end. Um, almost a week has passed since um, uh, the, our celebration and observance of Thanksgiving Day. It's, it's great to see a nation that comes together and gives thanks. So let us join together and give thanks to all of, the, all of those who have done something for us, and more importantly, mean something to us. Let us thank parents, teachers, friends, uh, and again, everyone who has made a difference in our lives and everyone 
we hold dear. Um, this is a book about women, so I dedicated it to the five women in my history. This is about women in history. I dedicated it to five women, uh, giving thanks to them, who have shaped my history. And they are my mother, my grandmother, my aunt, my wife, and my daughter. Um, so that is the very beginning of the book. Um, now, let's talk about the book. First, let me start by saying that History matters. Um, in fact, history matters in many ways and on multiple levels. Knowledge of the past often serves to shape and justify the world and worldviews of readers and writers alike. It is fair to say that in our time, the history of Islam is having a moment. This is an example of how and why history matters in justifying and shaping the world or worldview of its readers and writers. Uh, lots of histories of Islam have appeared over the past two decades or so. And um, no doubt the historical context for this shouldn't be ignored. Of course, not all readers or writers of histories of Islam are the same. Of course not. Some writers write such histories to inform, and most readers, we may hope, read them to become better informed about Islam. Sadly, but nevertheless as a matter of fact, some writers have misinformed or even disinformed the public in their writings on the history of Islam. And some readers, unfortunately, have ended up reading what only adds to confusion, confusion, misunderstanding, or even worse. So as a historian, I thought I should do my part and write an informative and hopefully engaging history of Islam. I thought I should try something new. Um, Dean Grafton mentioned that I studied at Columbia. I studied with one of the most innovative historians um, I have ever met. So and my, uh, for my part, I tried to be innovative. And I said I should do something new. And I decided to write a history of Islam around women. Of course, there is nothing new in writing about women in Islam. As a historian, I know that. Um, in fact, as early as the ninth century, I was described as a medieval person, so I should <laughs> bring that up. Uh, as early as the ninth century, that is more than a thousand years ago, Muslim authors wrote about women and compiled whole biographical dictionaries on women. And a quick Google search reveals that, especially since the 1980s, plenty of books have appeared on women in Islam or on women and Islam. Now this book is, my book is nothing like that. These books are informative and uh, uh, most of them are, but there are some exceptions. So what I wished to do, and I thought it would be somehow new, would be to write a history of Islam all the way from the seventh century to the present that was organized around a number of women. It's not about the origins of Islam, it's not about the caliphate. It's not about kings and uh, great rulers in Islam. It is also not about the male uh, learned elite, the so-called ulama. There are lots of books on uh, such topics. There are lots of histories of Islam uh, organized around those themes. Um, what is out now and what you have uh, and thanks for uh, getting the books to many of you. I really appreciate it, and I hope it will be <laughs> worth it. If not, don't ask me to sign them, just return them. <laughs> I hope it will be in, uh, informative, and dare I say, enlightening also. But that's not for me to judge. That is for you to say. So let me get into uh, a discussion of the book. What I'm going to do, I'm not going to talk about 21 women. I said my part about uh, methodology very uh, briefly. Um, so I thought what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about six 
of the, 25, of the 21 women, time permitting. I'm trying to make this as short as possible so that we get more Q&A, more discussion together. I'm going to talk about six women. But before that, let me just say that Islam is a global religion, and I'm not talking here, I'm not engaging the contemporary literature about the invention of world religions. I'm only using this term geographically. Islam has spread from Arabia and its origins to the United States, to North uh, America, everywhere on the globe. And China, as we know today, Islam has a history and is there. And as every student of history knows, in order to write history, it always helps, uh, not to say it's necessary, to have a timeline. And I, have, I came up with this time, timeline. I follow it in the book, again, from the seventh century to the present. Uh, the foundation, the origin of the Islamic calendar uh, goes back to year 622, uh, when the prophet of Islam migrated from the city of Mecca to Medina. And then I have these moments, I'll come back to them as I talk about each of the, um, of the six women. The first woman I'm going to talk about lived before 622, right? This is an important person in the formation of Islam. Her name is Khadija, and she was, uh, these are the six women I'm going to talk about. Back to the timeline. And the first woman I'm going to talk about is Khadija. She was uh, the prophet's wife, and more importantly, I think a point that needs to be emphasized is that Khadija was the first believer, the first mu'min. Today, more than ever, it is important to highlight that the first person to receive and accept the Prophet's message was a woman, and that is Khadija we are talking about. As a witness to the Prophet's sincerity of heart and nobility of spirit, she offered him love and bolstered his resolve. What we have historically is an embedded biography of Khadija. All biographies of these women that we are talking about, most of them, especially from the early period, uh, and particularly about Khadija, is a biography embedded and intertwined with the biography of the Prophet. We don't have an independent biography, so I tried to, to present an independent biography. Uh, she lived in the city of Mecca. I have a, an artist's rendition of what seventh century uh, Mecca uh, probably looked like. She lived from probably 560 to 619. Um, 618, 619. I think 619 is more accurate. Uh, excavations from 1989 have unearthed the house where Khadija and uh, Prophet Muhammad lived for over 20 years. This is an image. This place has now been uh, demolished, and I think a hotel is being built uh, around it. But this is from 1989. Now, back in the seventh century, the town of Mecca uh, was a center of regional and long distance trade, and uh, it distressed the young Muhammad with its pervasive injustice, moral decay, and spiritual emptiness. He labeled all that he disliked about it as darkness or ignorance, or folly, uh, jahiliya. He called it jahiliya. Um, so sometimes he withdrew to a cave in a nearby hill. You see the hill in the back. And on his return, he would first visit the holy site at the heart of Mecca, a place known as the Kaaba. That is the black uh, cube that you see at the, uh, in, on, on the picture. And this stood less than an hour's walk from his home with Khadija. One summer night in the year 610, when uh, Khadija's husband was about 40 years old, he cut short his habitual period of seclusion in the cave and went back home. Something happened to him, something inexplicable, and he stumbled home. When he went home, he confided in Khadija. And this is very important. Imagine a man going home, seventh century, and telling his wife that God talked to him, or an angel talked to him. If that happens in the 20th century, what happens? Usually the wives say, well, um, rest a little bit, then we'll talk. This is not what happened with Khadija. Khadija believed Muhammad. Khadija believed in Muhammad. And he said, she said she told him 
this is something serious. We have to take it seriously. And she went out. She went to a person she respected very much, she admired. She went to a cousin, a cousin Waraka, and he told him, he told her that um, Muhammad was a prophet of the end of times. He was the prophet of the Arabs. And that she, that is Khadija, should support him and also be aware that the enemies of God are going to hurt him, to persecute him, and to push him out of his homeland. And Khadija gave all she had to the last dying breath to support her husband. And she died in 619. Um, and Muhammad called that year the year of sorrows, the year of affliction. This was the worst year for him until then. As we learn from the Gospels, no prophet is welcome in his homeland. So he left in 622, and that is the date that later became the origin of the Muslim calendar. In 622 he left. That was already three years after Khadija had died. He often reminisced about Khadija with his companions. He always said that there is no one like her ever. And we could wonder what would have happened should Khadija have lived a few more years. What kind of influence that would have had on the course of the development of Islam. What we know for certain as historians is that Khadija is a heroine of towering stature in Islamic history. Okay, this is the longest biography that I wanted to talk about. So I move fast. I move fast from uh, the uh, prophets' migration from Mecca to Medina to the 8th century when we have the foundation of the city of Baghdad. The city of Baghdad was, for many centuries, the most magnificent Islamic city. This was the seat of the so-called Abbasid Caliphate. And from the 8th century to the uh, 11th or early 12th century, we had more than one caliphate. That's very important. We had more than one caliphate. It was the Umayyad Caliphate of the uh, 7th and 8th centuries, the Abbasids in Baghdad, based in Baghdad, and there were others. For example, there was the Fatimid Caliphate in Cairo. And I'm going to talk about that. There was another caliphate based in Cordoba uh, that I don't talk about in the book. Here I want to talk about the, uh, a woman who ruled Yemen. You see where Yemen is. Her name was Arwa, and she ruled for 50 years. She ruled Yemen for 50 years. So this is not something that happened as a regent for three months until the sun is brought to, to, to power. She ruled Yemen for 50 years. And she was an ally of the Fatimids, and the Fatimids ruled from Egypt. They had a network of allies. And in Yemen, she was their ally for, as I said, for 50 years. First, she was married to the local ruler, but the ruler was um, incompetent or sickly, so she took over. After he died, she became the de facto uh, ruler of Yemen. And what she did, that is a building, that is a mosque that she built, still a place of uh, attraction today. Uh, she lived and ruled in uh, southern Yemen, southwest Yemen. What is important to emphasize is that from her base in Yemen, for 50 years, I keep repeating, she ruled not only trade routes inside Yemen, but also sea trade routes going to East Africa, going to East Africa, going north along uh, the Arabian Peninsula, probably, uh, definitely to Oman, what is today Oman, probably as far northwest as what is today Qatar. And more importantly, she established a connection with India. So this is what she controlled, 50 years. I talk about that in the book. She was a very powerful woman. There is one incident that I uh, cite in the book. Uh, in one instance, her daughter came to her and complained that her husband was taking a second wife. Um, she sent the army and made him an offer he could not refuse. Right? That kind of a woman we are talking about here. Okay, the 
next person I would, I would like to talk about. So this one was from the period from the uh, 11th to the early 12th century. We can talk about the contents of what happened at that time. I have women from the uh, period from the 13th to the uh, 15th century. I have one woman in the book from Spain, from uh, southern Spain, from Andalus and North Africa, who was, uh, again, an independent ruler of part of what is now Morocco and southern Spain. Um, European sources refer to her as a pilot. Muslim sources almost entirely ignore her. So what we know about her is what we have recovered recently. I have a chapter on her. And then I have a chapter, I have a few chapters from the 16th and 17th centuries. One of them uh, about the first of three women who ruled in Indonesia, right? And Indonesia in this, um, on the tip of, of that uh, peninsula, at the place called Aceh. Now, if you remember, just a few years ago, there was a uh, destructive tsunami. Anyone remember the tsunami? The tsunami was, uh, took place in what used to be her territory. And this is a, this is a 7th, 17th century rendition by a Dutch artist. And the Dutch were very much present in what is now Indonesia and Malaysia. Uh, they had a center in Batavia. And, and what, why I, I mentioned this woman, Tajul Alam uh, Sultana Safiatuddin, is because of a negotiation, a very important negotiation she had with the, with the Dutch. The name of the chapter for her is Diamonds Are Not Forever. And why do I choose this title? We have all, I'm assuming, heard the story of how the functionaries, the representatives of the West, of the Dutch West India Company, bought the 22,000 acre island of Manhattan from the Lenape Indians, right? Whatever the meaning of purchase may be, buying may be, what we have is that either uh, Pierre Menuit, Peter Menuit, or some other functionary of the Dutch West India Company um, managed to buy the island for how much, do you remember? The equivalent of, uh, for, for 60 guilders, guilders being the uh, unit of currency that was used at the time. Now, when, this was in 1626, when Safiya Tuddin, this woman, Tajul Alam Safiya Tuddin, came to the throne when she was 29, the East, the Dutch East India Company gave her a bill, gave her a bill and requested 100,000 guilders. 60 guilders, 100,000 guilders. What was the bill for? Her husband had a taste for diamonds, apparently. And he had ordered several diamonds from the Dutch and, and the Dutch uh, in Holland, in Amsterdam, they made the best of diamonds at the time, right? Flat diamonds, pear-shaped diamonds, all kinds of diamonds. And he insisted on the diamonds being specially cut for him. He also ordered a throne made of gold that weighed 2,000 pounds or so. So the price tag that was presented to his wife after he died was 100,000 guilders. What is this idiosyncrasy about diamonds and emeralds and gold thrones? These were signs of legitimation, uh, no less than anywhere in, in Aceh. But Safiya Tutin said, no, no, we don't need this. We didn't need this. You haven't delivered everything. We are not going to accept this. So for four years, she negotiated with the Dutch and eventually with the support of the elite in her town. And she ruled for several years. She ruled for over 20 years. Uh, she ruled for over 20 years. She convinced the Dutch to, first of all, the decision was, diamonds are not going to be the basis of evaluation. So the Dutch were deprived of setting the price for what they were selling. And also she negotiated it and brought it down to a much lower price. And she paid for the most part in kind. She said, okay, you can use the ports in Aceh and that is part of the repayment. And this 
maybe 50, 60 years in the history of Indonesia from the uh, 1640s to around the year 1700, we have a succession of female rulers in Indonesia. Eventually, the reign of the queens came to an end by, by the local uh, learned elite, the men, who said it is not becoming for an Islamic society to have women rulers. Where does this come from? This is something that I discuss in the book in detail. There are two very important sayings that underlie the position toward the women in Muslim societies uh, to a very large extent. Not that everything is reducible to two sayings, but these two have played a very important role. One has been that any nation that delegates its affairs to women is bound to fail. This is how they ousted, the ulama ousted Taj al-Alam and her successors from power. There is another one, there is another saying, also from the Prophet, also attributed, both of them are attributed to the Prophet, that says, it doesn't matter on the outside whether one is a woman or a man. What matters is the inside. What form does not matter at all. Therefore, when Arawa was uh, ruling Yemen for 50 years, they said, yes, it doesn't matter. She, is, she, may be, she may look like a woman on the outside, but what is important is not whether one looks like a man or a woman. What matters is what is on the inside. And I should say that Arawa was also a religious leader, not only a political leader. In the case of Taj al-Alam, she was only a political leader. Uh, leader. Now I move to the next example. My next example is from Africa, is from West Africa, is from um, what is now um, Nigeria. Now in recent years, we have heard many horrific accounts of atrocities perpetrated about, about, uh, on young women in Nigeria, right? We have a terrorist group that prides itself in kidnapping schoolgirls, right? And they claim, this group uh, claims that it is a direct descendant of a caliphate that existed in um, West Africa up until the early 1900s. Around 1903, it was abolished. But it started earlier in the 18. Uh, 30s and 1840s, and the woman I'm t and the person I'm talking about, related to that caliphate, is a woman we know as Nana Asmao, who was the daughter of the leader of the caliphate, of the founder of the caliphate, a very important figure, religious figure in Africa, known as Osman Dan Fadio, and his son, and her own husband. These were the founders of the caliphate. She uh, took on a different task. Nana Asmao. She, after the war, after the jihad, after the disintegration of um, norms and, and order in West Africa, she said the only way to reconstitute and reconstruct what is torn apart about is the education of women. Education of women. So she wrote poetry in three languages, in Fulfulde, in Arabic, and uh, somewhat uh, less in a third language, a third local language. And women would come from villages all around, uh, from a very large, uh, long distance, from as far northwest as Mali um, and, and the farther east. They would come with their tablets. This is a tablet that a present day little girl in, in, the, in Nigeria is holding. They call it Aloa. And the teacher, the woman teacher, was called the Malama. And um, Nana Asmao was a Malama, was a teacher. And she trained a generation of women teachers. And by teaching little girls, she reconstructed and restructured um, West African society in her time. OK. I hope we can have a discussion about this later on. My next example is from the 20th century. Um, I've already talked 35 minutes. I'll be fast. Um, this is Noor Inayat Khan. Her chapter I have uh, entitled The Anxiety of Belonging. She was a daughter of an Indian father and an American woman. She was born in Russia 
in St. Petersburg or Moscow. Um, we don't know exactly which. Uh, she grew up in England and then in Paris. She died in Germany in a concentration camp. She was shot dead because she was a spy for the Allied forces. And so this is another woman that I talk about. Last year, when I was writing the book, a year and a half ago, there was, a, there was an initiative in England to have her picture on the 50 pound uh, note. It failed. Uh, the, the motion failed, and it, it's, it's very good that we have another important picture, and that is the uh, image of Alan Turing on the 50 pound note. But I think there is still room to have her picture replace Churchill on the five pound note, but <laughs> maybe. So there is some information about where she grew. She, she grew up, she was a musician, she was, she was a Sufi, and she was a spy. So, so much for that. Last, I'm going to talk about a singer. Now, I want to bring this to your attention that the concept of the Middle East is a 20th century concept, right? Uh, Middle East, middle of what? Where is East? Where are you looking from? Right? If you are looking from London, it is East. It's somewhere between China and where we are, where they are, therefore it is Middle East. Uh, there is Near East, there is Middle East, there is Far East. So this is a concept that came out of World War, of the context of World War. First, the First World War that shaped this region that we know as, uh, as the Middle East, and then the Second World War when uh, this region played a very important role strategically. But what I'm going to talk about is not the World War period. I'm talking about another moment in the history of the Middle East. Uh, the history of the Middle East is a history of reshaping and changing. It has changed. It has had many moments, right? All the countries in the Middle East, nearly all the countries, from Morocco on the west to Iran on the east, somehow changed during the formation of the Middle East. Some countries came into existence. They didn't exist such as um, Qatar or the United Arab Emirates or Saudi Arabia or uh, Kuwait. These were not independent uh, nations before, even Iraq. Um, but Turkey had a long history. Iran had a long history of uh, a nationhood, probably. But one of the moments that gave shape to what we know as um, the Middle East uh, is what is known as the Six-Day War in 1967. Um, this was a day of intense conflict between Arab forces and Israeli forces. So on the morning of June 5th, 1967, Israeli bombers strafed airfields in Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and Iraq. By June 10th, Israeli troops had seized land from four Arab countries, the West Bank and, the Jeru and Jerusalem from Jordan and Golden Heights from Syria, the Sinai Peninsula and the Gaza Strip from Egypt, and Saudi Arabia's Tehran Island in the Red Sea. The loss of human life, honor, and territory left many inconsolable, not merely in Egypt and the Arab notion, nations, but also elsewhere. It left 200,000 men dead and wounded, and most of them were Egyptians. Now, I'm saying that this moment, 1967, was a formative moment, was a reshaping moment in the Middle East, and the voice of consolation at the time was the voice of a woman, the voice of Umm Kulthum. I don't know any Arab older than 40 years who doesn't connect with Umm Kulthum. Do you? Umm Kulthum, there is a nice documentary made on her. It's on YouTube, you can see it. They ask a regular man on the street in Cairo, and they say, um, who is Umm Kulthum? What do you know about Umm Kulthum? He hesitates for a moment and says, Umm Kulthum? She's like the pyramids. Right? And that's, that's the stature and status of Umm Kulthum in, in um, contemporary Arab thought, maybe Muslim thought. Now, I have other women from the 20th century, 19th century, 20th century. I won't go into that. I won't take more time. I just want to say, I want to raise one question at the end. Is this an acceptable way of telling Islamic history? Is it OK? Is it proper? to have this range of women brought in to talk about history of Islam. Is Umm Kulthum part of Islamic history? I have had 
friends, Muslim friends, who come to me and say, you know, this is not acceptable. Why are you including her alongside the Prophet's wife? Why are you having this? That's a question that I would like to uh, discuss with you, if it's also a question for you. More importantly, the reason that I did this was that I already realized from the very beginning that writing a history around women is bound to be controversial, is bound to raise controversy. These are contested biographies. These are contested in religious terms from a sectarian point of view, and they are also contested in the modern context, for example, by feminists, right? So there are all kinds of contentions around these biographies, and I think by not addressing controversies directly, but by telling these stories, being aware of the controversies, but not allowing the controversy to shape the narrative, I have presented a history of Islam around 21 women. Uh, as I said, I uh, have hoped that this book will be uh, widely read, and I had some very encouraging response in the beginning. I had um, an offer to have the book published in India, and also a major French publisher came forward, and they uh, expressed an interest to sign a contract with my uh, British publisher. As recently as two days ago, and this is talking about the contested nature of these biographies, the famous publisher wrote to my British publisher and said, here are the reasons why I have finally decided not to publish Hussein Kamali's book. The narrative in the book adopts a standpoint view, her English, from inside the Islamic world that seems to me hardly compatible with the laïcité à la française standpoint. The author, being Imam Ali chair in Shia studies and dialogue among Islamic schools of thought at the Hartford Seminary, as I discovered recently, it is perfectly coherent, but too far away, in my opinion, from what a French reader expects to find while reading a book on women and Islam. The actual French context regarding Islam is difficult and can't be ignored today. End of quote. Replace Islam with race, replace Islam with other religions, and you be the judge. The, my, my publicist, who is a very professional um, person, wrote to me and said this is very disappointing and she's going to look for another publisher. But it is not disappointing to me at all. If anything, it, is, uh, it justifies what I have tried to do. It emboldens me to say, first of all, women's history is human history. And we ought to include women in any history of Islam. And we have to do it. There are many ways of doing it. This is my way of doing it. I hope there are other people who will come and write other kinds of histories of Islam around women. Um, so I think this is how I want to bring this presentation to a closing. And then I look forward to hearing from you, and I look forward to having a fruitful discussion with you. Thank you very much. These are some of the other women I have in the book. But yes, any thoughts? I am going to pass the microphone to the person asking the question so that everyone can hear. If we're facing this way, it's really hard for people in the back to hear. So, did you? I kind of appreciate your work in terms of um, bringing light to women's history because I feel like as I was growing up, like le learning history in school, mm -hmm. like there's not really a lot of history on women and it's kind of like really, like I feel like now it's more important than ever to like, like um, share the women's stories throughout history. Thank you so much, that's a very good point. And you know this year, March 8th, will be another important uh, day for the observance of Women's Year or Women's Day. And I'm glad to say that there are many books out there now more consciously and intentionally addressing women 
and women's history. There are all kinds of books. And I can, we can maybe talk about some kinds that there are out there. One book that was particularly um, inspiring for me was a book by a radio personality in England um, named Jenny Marie, who wrote a book called A History of Britain and 21 Women. The 21, if you're wondering, is the 21st century. Otherwise, history by numbers has its limitations, right? A History of Britain and 21 Women. She wrote another book uh, recently published, um, A History of the World in 21 Women. We could have a history of science in 21 women. We should have a history of New York in 21 women. Maybe we could have a history of the Hartford Seminary in 21 women. And you know, MT should be on that list of 21 women. Yes. Najib, that's a question. Say thank you very much. Um, First, definitely congratulations for a very interesting book. In very kind. And uh, I can see just on the margin the image of Zaha Hadid yes. over there. That's the Iraqi famous architect. architect. She's genius. That's correct. Well, thank you for mentioning her. Indeed. Thank you very much. Um, I, I would like to describe your book, that's a comment, and then I will ask. Sure. Um, as reading history from a third eye perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first eye would be the eye of the winners. Right. See, yeah. The second eye, the eye of um, males. Right. So you're inviting us quite amicably to uh, read history from a third eye perspective, which I think is worth reading indeed. So thank, thank you, you for that. Thank you. Um, I would like to invite you to tease out more information about uh, some of the theses or thinking strategies mm -hmm. that led you to write in your book about these 21 women and no others. Because mm -hmm. you know more than I that Islamic history is full of other women maybe you could have also mentioned. So can you share with us a little bit about right. what made you shoot these women and if there is anything common that sort of connect them uh, right. to enable us to read Islamic history in sort of one coherent right. way, if possible. Thank you for your very kind comment, and thank you for your important question. What I've tried to do is to follow the timeline that I presented. So I have some early women that played a very important role in the formation of the religion of Islam, right? I have. Uh, Prophet's wife Khadija, who died in 619. I have the Prophet's daughter. I have the Prophet's favorite wife uh, Aisha, a very important person. And I'm, when writing the book and now after publishing it, I'm very much aware of the sectarianism around these figures, right? I'm very much aware of that uh, and the kind of responses that I get. You know, the uh, Shias say it's not Shia enough. The Sunnis say, well, it is too Shia. So, uh, which, is, uh, which is neither. It's historical. And um, it's, it avoids controversy. It, I follow the timeline because that timeline, I think, is important. The formative period, the expansion before the Mongols, and then what happens with the collapse of uh, most Muslim societies with the coming of the Mongols in the 13th century. And again, the role that some women play. For example, in, in Tetuan, in, in Morocco, fighting against the Portuguese, right, the 16th century. Uh, the woman I mentioned, Sayyidat al-Hurra, right, about which Muslims have almost nothing. We know her from European sources, and then we have a little bit more information on her. I talk about the Safavids, the Mughals, uh, Nur Jahan is here, you know, of, of uh, tremendous fame. There, is, um, there, are, there are women from Iran, from Turkey, the Ottoman land. And I don't present these as heroes. So to your point about why I selected these, these are not my heroes necessarily. For example, the uh, woman from, from the Ottoman uh, period, the mother of many sultans, that's I, how I describe her, um, she had her own grandson killed. She meant business. Right? She was also a very fun person. She had a, a carriage that she had received from Queen Elizabeth. She exchanged letters with Queen Elizabeth right, on matters of state. So if you see, there's a very famous picture of Queen Elizabeth. Everybody knows that. 
she's wearing a Turkish garment. She sent it for her, most likely. Right? So they exchanged the gifts. I tried, back to your very important question, to follow the timeline and to come to the period, to the, I have examples from the colonial period, right, 19th century. I talk about Um Kulsum in the contemporary um, imperial setting, right, the contentious uh, part of the Middle East. But again, it's not a book about politics. I also have Zaha Hadid. Now, people have pointed out that, okay, what does Zaha Hadid to do with Islam? Um, that is, I think, the wrong question. She has everything to do with Islam. She is a woman from a Muslim background. Whether she practiced or not, that is not my question. I'm not writing about being good Muslims. That is not the point. I'm talking about how these Muslims, or Noor and Ayat Khan, what it means to be a woman, a young woman of 25, 26, of mixed parentage in England, and showing your loyalty. What does it mean? To fit in, what does it mean? And that's a question for many women in our time, right? And I talk about, the last entry in the book is Maryam Mirza Khani, whose death in 2017 uh, saddened me a lot. She comes from Iran, I know people who knew her, and she comes from, uh, she's many years younger than I am, but she came from a video that I had experienced myself. I think the choice, the argument of the book is in the choice. The argument of the book is, the cho is in the choice itself, right? Okay. Other points? Jackie. Hi. Thank you for this important book. Um, for me, as a woman, an Iranian woman, um, woman raised in the Islamic tradition. I find that it's, and I want your thoughts on this, it's almost impossible to separate what you're writing about and talking about right. from interpretation of power mm -hmm. and what it means to have power, what it means to be a woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in my opinion, you just to use your words about being a good Muslim, no one ever asks a man if they're a good Muslim, if they're leading a country, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the standard is right. very different for women. Right. And of course, you can talk about that in any context. Right. The standard is always different for women. Sure. Um, and so I'd like your thoughts about what you're hoping for us to take away from this book. When, in my opinion, you really can't separate women in, in Islamic countries right. from their status with regards to the power structure right. and their ability to have a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. if they do get that seat in the table, right. why are they erased from history? That's a great question. That's a great question. And let me uh, take a step back. First of all, to thank you for giving me the Persian sweets. I didn't expect it. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Ms. Jamshid. Very much appreciate it. And to your question, thank you. It is not about women who were or were not good Muslims. It is not about men who may have been good or bad Muslims. I think that is irrelevant to our appreciation of history. Again, the argument being in the selection, it very much shows that women had agency in Islamic history. So by writing a history of Islam in terms of women, I show that a Sufi woman from the 8th century, that is Rabia, very famous Sufi woman, she had agency to articulate what was properly, what it meant to be properly religious. Right? I talk about Queen Awa, who ruled for 50 years and determined for her subjects what was properly Islamic. Not only she was considered a proper Muslim by her followers, she told them what it meant to be a proper Muslim. One thing that I have noticed on the many books on Islam and women, or Islam in women, or the other one, the other way, uh, women in Islam, is that they look for, more often than not, either they look for famous women, right? And they also try to say, 
what is famous, who was famous, is someone who went against the norm, who somehow challenged the norm, right? There's a famous saying, I don't remember who said it, it's a very famous saying, everybody knows, that well-behaved women never did anything memorable. Remember that? I don't remember who said that, but right? they don't make history. This is wrong. This is historically false. This is historically false. It's very powerful, of course. One likes to hear that. The informing theory behind this book is that agency and subjectivity are not only shaped by opposition and revolt, but, but they are historically embedded and embodied. This is what I'm talking about. So this is not a book about naughty women, unruly women. There are lots of those out there. So theoretically, this is in keeping, and again, I don't show any history, in, any theory in the book. That's not what the book is about. It's a very simple book. I hope this book is read by high school students, high school teachers, professional men and women to have a different view of the history of Islam. It is not for the academics who are going to talk about agency and subjectivity and uh, liberal subjectivity and, and its alternatives. But there is a line of theory in contemporary anthropology that questions that women's subjectivity and agency only comes through in acts of rebellion. So the work of the late Pakistani-American anthropologist Sabo Mahmood established this back in, the, in her book from 2003, 2004. And then uh, in our time, uh, Laila Abu Logod and her uh, many students, and of course the leading feminist, Judith Butler, are talking about alternative manifestations of subjectivity and agency when it comes to women and men. But that is not something I elaborate on or I highlight in the book. Again, the argument is to be seen in the, in the examples that I cover. I hope I answered your very important question. Um, I have two, two quick questions, which is, one is, where does Benazir Bhutto fit? Mm -hmm. Because in our lifetime, we studied the separation of India and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. and, and then here comes a prime minister who's a woman. Right. And then, which to your point, fits in with the all all nations run by women fail because she ended up being assassinated, which was quite, it was quite something. Here was this rise of this woman. And the second is, is that we're living through right now is this huge diaspora of, of, of populations throughout the Middle East, which are now being moved within the Middle East as well as Europe, America, wherever they're going, is how does that, how do you see that that is going to affect education for Muslim women, and how does that come back? Because you know, what, what do you see? How does that movement affect okay. what's going to happen? Okay, that's uh, two questions. First, about Benazir Bhutto. Um, when I was writing the book, my mentor and um, teacher, and now friend, whom I mentioned in the beginning uh, as an innovative historian told me, don't go for the low-hanging fruit. Don't write on those everybody knows, right? There are lots of biographies of Benazir Bhutto. She was a very important person, and he actually knew her personally, had met her personally, had students who worked for her. Important figure. I didn't want to give the impression that all women or many women who did something ended up dead. There are a few examples here, at least one, but we don't. It is not all about uh, suppression of how, I'm not telling the story of how women were suppressed. That's not my um, undertaking. I'm telling history from the third eye, as you said, uh, Professor Rawat. I'm not trying to say, okay, if you're a Muslim, there is a, because uh, Jackie said she comes from Iran. In Iran, they say, if you're a real man, come to Iran and be a woman. <laughs> right? It's difficult. But that is not what I was going to elaborate on. It's a different uh, kind of book. Uh, they say, Iran uh, right? So, But that's not what I'm doing. Um, about the future of women's education, I think that is actually, that weighs heavily on our conscience 
and it should. It should weigh heavily on our conscience with the invasions, with warfare, with supporting dictators or, support, uh, supporting terrorist networks or everything that goes on in what you called, what I mentioned as the Middle East. It, it, it shows the importance of our duty in making sure that people don't perpetrate such acts in our name. It's, it's a time of very dire consequences, what has already happened in Syria, in Iraq, and elsewhere. But also in, among Muslim women, how many Muslim professionals, doctors, engineers, who are Muslim do we know in North America? Many, right? We have the only winner of the Fields Medal in mathematics, which is the highest achievable prize in mathematics. They say it's the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in mathematics. It's even harder, right? And there is only one woman who got it. She came from Iran. And she is part of this history. She is part of the history of the Iranian Revolution of 1979. And all its discontents, I'm not crediting her existence to the Iranian Revolution. I'm talking about the context. I hope it makes sense. anything about the book, but um, it's very difficult after you publish a book, you know, there are all kinds of mixed feelings about it. But no, I, I think this was because, sorry for the repetition, the argument that I constructed revolved around these women. So these are not by accident. Right? These are not low-hanging fruit. These are not famous. I meant to show something. For example, I meant to show by the woman, uh, the bigger picture, that in early 20th century Russia, there was a woman judge. Before the Bolsheviks came to, came to power, there was a woman judge in Russia, in Tatarstan. And she was murdered by Stalin in 1937. We know a lot about the persecutions of Stalin. We know a lot about what he did to various peoples. Very little is written about what kind of persecution happened to Muslims in the Soviet Union. So I picked this example. I worked very hard to make my choices um, deliberately in constructing the argument and forwarding the argument of the book. So I have no regrets. Yeah. Thank you for your uh, book and for your presentation. Um, I want to uh, ask about the criticism or the critiques that you've received from both the French press mm -hmm. as well as uh, Muslims who uh, would debate, for example, Al Qasim, even though she had a very uh, religious upbringing, she was raised by a father who was a sheikh, and so that, right. that I think led a lot to where she is in terms of being able to soothe uh, folks, especially in political. Um, conflict, but um, I, I feel like they're both uh, trying to hang on to a similar narrative, and um, so by trying to keep that one single narrative, mm -hmm. they are uh, promoting a certain agenda. So can you comment on what that um, gain is? What are they seeking to gain from that one narrative that they want to hang on to so much? Both the French press with their you know, current world view of where women uh, you know, stay in society and also the Islamic world view of you know, women should be only seen in this way or regarded in this way. Um, and it could be just a discussion about um, you know, France in general, or, or um, because I, I feel like a pendulum swings far in both directions. So um, I, I know there's a big movement right now amongst uh, Muslim women in accessibility towards a mosque. So there's a movement called No More Side Door, where they feel like you know they sh have always been marginalized in a mosque, um, and I've never seen that more than in the Grand Mosque in Paris, where the mosque entrance is you know, downstairs and very difficult to find. Yeah. But it's also, you know, comes from the same culture that wants to marginalize Muslims. So it seems like right. both sides are marginalizing them. And what are they gaining from that? 
I think the key to the answer is what Ms. Jamshid said about power, and the analysis of power. Where do women fit? Or where are, why are women excluded from structures of power? It is too much for me to elaborate in this discussion. But I will say something very briefly. Historically, and this is not in the book. Again, this is not something highlighted in the book. But these are ideas that fed into my mind when I was reading, when I was reading and writing um, for many years, reading uh, for a shorter time writing. There are two important groups that have worked very hard to shape Islamic discourse over the past 200 years. And why I say 200 years, 250 years, from the time that, uh, that Napoleon entered Egypt, from the time that the British took over India, right? So we are talking about 1750s, we are talking about 1790s. There was a deliberate effort by two groups, especially, to define what was meant as properly Islamic. One were the so-called Orientalists. Right? The so-called Orientalists wanted to tell us, the world, that this is what real Islam is. And I will, there is no quote that I know of which is more powerful than this verbatim um, quote from a writing by two very famous, very influential contemporary Orientalists. They wrote in a very uh, flimsy book in terms of argument, but a very successful book in terms of reception. And this is a verbatim quote. You decide what you make of it. The only obverse, this is the quote, the only obverse to Muslim gravitas is the giggling of their womenfolk is that disgusting or what? Replace Muslim with any other nationality or race and see what would happen to people who would say that. The people who said this were not expelled. They had the highest, most important jobs in Islamic studies in the world. And the only obvious to Muslim gravitas is the giggling of their women folk. People who come from Islamic backgrounds, is that true? Is that what you remember of your mothers and grandmothers and aunts? Is that it? If, is that who you are? No. Exactly. No. It is not the giggling of their women folk. So this is the Orientalist point of view that justifies, that essentializes the lower position of women and says this is, you know, this is it. This is the real Islam. And then there are spokesmen of official Islam who have also had a stake in keeping this going. There is a patriarchal structure, right? The Orientalist one and the local ones that go hand in hand. Uh, and historically, again, drawing on my, putting on my uh, medievalist hat, you see that as everywhere. You see that, you see this patriarchy everywhere. And seeing it everywhere does not condone it, does not make it right, right? It is no more right in medieval European history than it is right in contemporary Muslim societies. Therefore, I think, I said this already, and it may sound banal, I hope it doesn't, women's history is human history. All right? We have to, and the future of Islam, whatever it's going to be, women are going to have an important, are playing an important position in it, in shaping it. Not that they will be, they are currently. Right? So this, is, this feeds into the writing of the book. It's nowhere explicit in the book. Right? Any other? Do we have one more question, Comments? maybe? Um, so I just wanted to ask one question that, um, what would you say um, like to high schoolers about um, kind of trying to figure out about um, women's history like in your book or like like when searching more about like history because I feel like I don't think like I've really learned like a lot over like my elementary school middle school and now that I'm in high school I want to learn more yeah. but I just feel like I kind of like need 
like this is the opportunity now to kind of learn more about like women in history. I hope you will find it uh, informative and engaging and come back and we will talk about it after you have read it. <laughs> then we can talk about your yeah. experience reading it. And you know, as I'm a student myself, you know, a lifelong student, we read, we think, we discuss. That's the way to understand. Not only Islam, not only religion, but everything. That's the way we do it. We read, we think, we discuss, and do it again. Mm -hmm. It's a loop, right? Yeah. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.